This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by ERI. ERI has a mission to protect people, the planet, and your privacy, and is the largest fully integrated IT and electronics asset disposition provider and cybersecurity-focused hardware destruction company in the United States, and maybe even the world. For more information on how ERI can help your business properly dispose of outdated electronic hardware devices, please visit eridirect.com. Welcome to another edition of the Impact Podcast. I'm John Shigarian, and I'm so excited and honored to have with us today Sam Dennigan. He's the founder and CEO of Strong Roots. If you don't know what Strong Roots is, it's the burgers that I eat at my house. Strong Roots makes these wonderful, delicious burgers. We're going to be talking about those and everything else Strong Roots makes and, and everything behind the company. But before we do that, Sam, welcome to the Impact Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Great to be here. Nice to meet you, John. Hey, great meeting you too. You're sitting in beautiful uh, New Jersey today. I'm in Fresno, California, and your, your roots are in Ireland, and my roots are in New York. So I guess technology allows us to connect and be more connected than ever before. And for that, I'm grateful. And, uh, you know, Sam, before we get talking about your company, for any of our listeners or viewers who want to find your great company, Strong Roots, they could go to www.strongroots.com. Tell us a little bit about the Sam Dennigan backstory. How did you even get here? I grew up in food, John. Um, I was lucky enough. My, my dad had inherited a company from his dad, my grandfather and my namesake. So ever since I was a child, I was in and around fresh produce, you know, potatoes, vegetables, salads. Wow. My, uh, my, my excitement on a Saturday morning as a kid was going to work with my dad so that I could go out on the trucks with his drivers and uh, and and do stops so that I could grab ice cream in the in the service station on the way. So how much fun I've, is that? I've, that's a lot again. of fun. How, yeah. how much fun is that? Those are great memories. Yeah, I mean everything everything from from as long far back as I can remember has been about food. So I I initially had no interest in the family business uh, through school and was going a different direction. I was a designer. I was an artist. I wanted to go into advertising. And then uh, once I got in to do that, uh, it started pulling me back in. And um, I think when you've got such strong roots in agriculture and food and so many family members that make that kind of business fun, you're kind of destined to get in there anyway. So I, um, my family's business is of the same name. It's called Sam Dennigan and Company which is a, a large wholesale distribution food service supplier, kind of like a UNFI or a Kehi in North America. Oh, really? And uh, yeah, and I, and I grew up in that business and, and worked in it for 10 years as a career before, before starting Strong Roots. So I did everything from washing the floors to checking the orders to running the IT department to, you know, having lots of experience in operations and sales and marketing. And then eventually I ended up discovering brands, brands and food specifically. And I matched off my creative uh, uh, ability from, from my time, my very brief time in art college with this love and passion for telling the stories about agriculture. You know, I, I grew up knowing about where things came from and uh, and love telling the stories about it and adding you know value and 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 interest to products, and in fresh produce that's quite difficult because it's quite commoditized. But um, I wanted to find a way, and and uh, Strong Roots has been that way. Um, after ten years in the family business, I um, I wanted to do something myself, and I found a couple of opportunities and. Um, had done lots of travel globally, looking at different agriculture growing um, uh, regions, principally Spain, uh, South America, North America, um, various different parts of Europe. Ireland is uh, self-sufficient in the summer season, but in the winter season, everything is imported. All the fresh produce is imported from Europe and further afield. So I used to have to try and figure out you know, where it was coming from, where we were getting it and, and how much we needed. 
So my education from a very young age was just where food came from. And I realized that that was what people needed to understand. They needed to understand about how they could get it, where they could get it from, but also how they, how they could do it sustainably. And um, that's, what's, that's what's led us to the foundation of Strong Roots and the journey that we've been on for the last six years. So a lot of that makes total sense in terms of your background is a wonderful produce name with your name on it, fruits and vegetables, national footprint. Where was the epiphany to say, I want to get involved with making plant-based foods, given that you came out of that industry, but did you realize that you wanted to change the world and make the world a better place because plant-based eating is necessary just for all of us to feel better and to cut down carbon emissions? Was it political? Was it emotional? Was it just strictly business? Oh my gosh, this opportunity is so much white space in plant-based eating. Where of all these different data, data points, when entrepreneurs put together data points and they come up with an epiphany and make a decision, where were you leaning the strongest towards when you came up with this great company, Strong Roots? I was developing a brand in Ireland um, under license from General Mills at the time, which is a brand that you'll know well, which is Green Giant. Sure. And we had licensed the brand from the General Mills organization as a group of companies in Europe that were trying to bring Green Giant into fresh produce. It's, it's obviously been very successful in the U.S. and the U.S. company who had the, the, the license of the brand wanted to bring it to Europe. And I was tasked with trying to figure out uh, from a research basis, you know, is this something that our consumers want? Um, this is all in fresh, remember. This has nothing to do with frozen plant-based food at this stage. But what I, what I uncovered in probably early 2011, 2012, was ultimately this trend that has now become a huge part of our lives, vegetarianism, veganism, and plant-based eating on a, on a mass, you know, conventional scale, as opposed to something that had been quite niche for, um, for so many years before. And my expertise is in, you know, agribusiness, it's in crops, it's in varietals, it's understanding seasonality and, what was very clear from a consumer point of view was that people didn't want the standard vegetables that they had been served for the previous 20 years. And that was something that was consistent both from private label and from brands in the Irish market. Uh, when it came to things like carrots and cabbage and potatoes, you know, people were sick of them. And we 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 coined this 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 phrase during that piece of research, which was what are the aspirational vegetables that people were interested in? And one of the main emergers in Europe specifically at that time was, was sweet potato. Sweet potato has gone from being 0% of market share of, of potato in, in Europe to being almost 25 to 30% today. It's it had a huge growth in Europe where it ne never existed before. And, and, and that research phase just proved that this was bigger than any brand. It was an opportunity to get ahead of the curve in terms of what the consumer was expecting to see, what they were seeing on cooking shows, what they were seeing in cookbooks, you know, what were chefs doing in restaurants. It was very much a conversion from the world of, you know, very, very premium quality white linen service restaurant food into retail. How do we make the jump? And how do we make the jump at a price point that people will buy it en masse as opposed to just a tiny, tiny uh, a corner of the store? So during that period and that development of that project with the, with the General Mills brand, um, I realized how big this opportunity was. But it wasn't until um, uh, 2015 when we changed tact from the uh, fresh world into the frozen world. And the reason that it was so important as a, as a pivot and a shift from fresh to frozen is because fresh was able to innovate faster. Fresh was commoditized. Fresh could get to the market quicker. Whereas frozen had been undeveloped in Europe for 30 years. You had French fries and potatoes. You had 
meat that had been riddled in scandal from the horse meat crisis, specifically in the UK and in the early noughties. And then you had these beige products that were covered in breadcrumbs and gluten, and they were covering either chicken or beef or, you know, cheese and nothing in that category, nothing in the frozen world whatsoever was geared to a healthy lifestyle. Um, pizza, ice cream, potatoes, French fries, etc. So all we did was do the opposite to the market was doing. And we were the first to do it in Ireland. And we were one of the first to do it in the UK. And that had snowballed into, you know, from this one piece of insight from this, you know, relatively inexpensive piece of consumer research, which was people don't eat meat and two veg anymore. And uh, yeah. that's, that was the, that was the, the, the epiphany of, hold on, we've got something here. We've got to move with it. That's so awesome. Hey, you know, go back. I just want to ask you about sweet potatoes because I grew up eating sweet potatoes because my grandmother did. It was yeah. a family thing. But, but, you know, different products, we've seen almonds and pistachios and pomegranates with palm wonderful get their star treatment. Was Did the, did the uptick from zero to 30, 35% of sweet potatoes happen because of some unique advertising campaign or did consumers taste change or... How did you guys go from zero to 35 on sweet potato consumption in Europe? I think, uh, to be fair, most of the industry would be accepting of the fact that the North Carolina Sweet Potato Commission and the, the universities down there did an unbelievable marketing job for sweet potato, not just in the U.S., uh, with the rise of brands like Alexia and um lots of development in private label but also in europe you know those guys they had a crop they had you know government investment they had the lower social demographic area that they wanted to put back to work and still do and ultimately they had to make use of the crop that they were famous for and i think they're probably single-handedly responsible for the emergence of, of of sweet potato into europe and it's just not slowing down. That's you all. Know, it's 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 one of our key. It was our first. Uh, it was our first product, which we actually made and produced in North Carolina, and then exported it back to Ireland. We were the first sweet potato fry brand in, in Ireland, the second in the UK, and we we were laggards. You know, fresh had been a huge thing in Europe for years, but we were the the first ones to make it a, a frozen French fry. That's wonderful. Oh, sweet potato fries are just to me the best. Just the best. Sam, I, I, since I haven't been to your beautiful country yet, and I intend to go either later this year or sometime next year, how was the trend of, you know, obviously now I understand your business model, your vision, then where does it intersect with, where was vegetarianism and veganism as a trend uh, in, in Ireland at the time? Is, it, is, it, is there a, a huge population? of vegetarianism and veganism, or is it, is, it, is it now just slowly building? John, you know, you'll know that Ireland is famous for, very famous for three things. It's, it's beef, it's, it's butter, mainly Kerrygold, uh, and, it, and it's dairy products. And, um, you know, it's, it's the cornerstone of an export industry in Ireland. So, you know, in short, there are much less vegans, you know, in Ireland um, at that stage, you know, at the inception of the brand than there are now. Um, it's changing rapidly. Uh, it's changing really quickly. You know, we've we've gone from being non-existent to a very big part of the fabric of Irish consumption and, and UK consumption in a very short space of time. But, you know, it's really, really recent you're talking about the last five or 10 years emerging as a trend. And I would say it's principally, you know, reducitarian, flexitarian, as opposed to uh, right. vegetarian or vegan. Um, there's obviously a, a very, very core central group of, of vegan consumers that have been in Ireland for, for years, but now it's mainstream and it's only been mainstream for a relatively short amount of time. If you just joined us, we've got Sam Dennigan. He's the founder and CEO of Strong Roots. To find Sam, his colleagues, and his delicious products, please go to www.strongroots.com. I have two of the boxes of the products that I enjoy in my household, 
as my as my uh, listeners and viewers know, I'm a vegetarian. I'm a vegan. Been a vegetarian over 40 years. Vegan just about the last 12 or 13. These products, these burgers, are just delicious. Simply delicious. Um, how many products do you have now, Sam? Approximately, you launched about six years ago. How many wonderful, delicious products do you have in the frozen section? We we across the group we have about uh, fifteen uh, unique products right now. Uh, six of those are in the U.S. with lots more coming soon. But um, yeah, we've got fifteen roughly split split between you know what we call potato or no potato, which is our you know carb reduction uh, area of products. We do delicious products like cauliflower hash browns, zucchini hash browns, sweet potato fries, and and a mixed root vegetable fry made from um, delicious beets, carrots, and parsnips, which are quite an unusual combination in North America, but are doing really, really well here. And then from a meat alternative perspective, we have the two burgers that you, uh, you've you shown everybody, but also um, another uh, uh, burger and a whole appetizer range of bites ranging from spinach to pumpkin to sweet potato all delicious we're a we're a taste first brand so sometimes we leave things in there like gluten although it's being reduced more and more all the time to make sure that they they taste great first uh, everything everything else comes after that your products taste not great they taste beyond great I, they're just delicious you know sam um uh, about that where we have listeners and viewers around the world in the United States. Obviously, we have a huge listener base in the UK and Ireland and, and way beyond in Asia as well. Where can our listeners and viewers find your great products now here in the United States and in UK and Ireland? What kind of stores are carrying? carrying? I, I buy these at Whole Foods here in, in the United States. So Whole Foods, I know, is carrying. Where else can our listeners and viewers find your yeah. great products? Yeah, Whole Foods is uh, is is a national account for us, so you can find those products as, as well as four others in in all of their stores, uh, in 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 all of their locations. Um, we're also in uh, approximately two thousand Walmart stores. Wow! Uh, both coasts in the south of the Great Lakes as well. Not so many in the in the middle yet, but we're working on it. Um, and um, then on the both coasts in the in the specialist natural retailers. You'll find them in, in Wegmans, in, in, in ShopRite. You'll find them in, in Sprouts. You'll find them in the Fresh Market. Um, and uh, really, really soon in the next uh, few weeks, we're going to be launching with Kroger across a lot of their banners as well and about um, just over 1,000 stores. So we've been we've been making tracks, and they're available for, for, for everyone across the country now. You know, Sam, given your background, and you gave me a great data point because I know these companies well. Um, my wife's family is in the food business as well, just uh, generationally speaking, like like uh, yours was. Because of uh, your family owning uh, Sam Denigan and company, uh, and being that it's a UNFI or Cahey type of company in Ireland, and you understanding distribution. How much of an advantage for you, the fact that you grew up in that industry, you taught, you worked there for 10 years, you understood distribution, for you to invent a great product is one thing, because we know there's lots of wonderful entrepreneurs out there inventing and creating wonderful and tasty products in all different food sectors, mm -hmm. even in the beverage sector. But getting it distributed is a whole different art and business model. How yeah. much of an advantage did you have because of your family history? I think that's a that's a really good question. I think one of the one of the leapfrog steps that we were able to make was we could have we didn't by the way, but we could have avoided setting up the stall at the farmers market to prove the concept. You know, um, we did that because we wanted to engage with our customers, but we knew what worked and what didn't work. You know, I was very fortunate to grow up in a situation where there was a warehouse of brands that I could walk around looking at where the big pallets were and where the small pallets were and knowing that that's working and that's not working. And those guys are, you know, those guys are in trouble. 
So understanding, you know, from a first person experience of what was happening was unbelievably invaluable because you knew not just of how to distribute a product, how to build a pallet, what kind of a case to put it in, how to make everything as easy as possible in the supply chain to move it around so that everyone's job was easy. And I think those are the biggest pitfalls for for startup food companies. It's about moving from, I've got something delicious to I can distribute this nationally. Uh, it's, it's, it's one of my biggest points of mentorship on, on, on when I'm speaking to young brands is, you know, don't assume the start is the end, you know, almost, um, uh, you know, you've got to, you've got to write the, the perfect picture of how this looks in a thousand stores to get it in a thousand stores. And there's so many steps in, in, and, and hoops to jump through to get there. Um, it's, it, it's phenomenal. You're, so we had a, we had a huge leg up for sure. Because you are so, you speak of it so calmly. And when I have friends or I've made investments in the food and beverage space, they're literally frantic about getting distribution and they don't even understand the, the political and e, the political ecosystem that exists in that industry is so unique. And you're, you, you're so uh, wise about it and calm about it. And obviously you're succeeding in it, but others sometimes never find their place or find their audience because they just never understand how to break into it. So it's just yeah. fascinating what you've done. You've not only created delicious products, but also because of your experience and your education um, and, and family and, and formal, you, you really uh, have broken the code on, on distribution, which is just, it's just wonderful. Um, talk a little bit about, let's go beyond taste. Uh, talk about the social and ecological benefits to being a plant-based eater, or at least making part of, like you said, I think the days of, of ideological, I'm a vegetarian, I'm a vegan, and God forbid I taste meat again ever, uh, the, you know, hell will freeze over. I think those days of ideological discussions are sort of fading away. And as you say, people are learning to incorporate delicious products. And again, shameless plug, but because I love these products, I'm allowed to shamelessly plug them. Um, I think people are flexitarian, pescatarian, but they enjoy great plant-based eating. Talk a little bit about some of the great benefits that come along with shifting our diet to more, you know, more plant-based eating, social and environmental and ecological benefits that are just yeah. huge. You know, it, 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 it's kind of, you know, tiresome, but, but still relevant to, to need to explain on a regular basis that we need to consume less animals in, in order for um, uh, the improvement of personal and planet health. There's no two ways about it. And for me, who follows a balanced Mediterranean lifestyle and diet more so than any uh, end of the spectrum, you know, for me, it's about, you know, understanding how to create a demand as a result of easier access. So, you know, our, our objective as a brand is to be a gateway for non-plant-based eaters to eat plant-based foods without a huge amount of education. How do you make it easier for people to access things without ramming it down their throat and without making them feel guilty about things at the same time? You know, let's, let's bring people to the water as opposed to, you know, push them in the pool. So for us, you know, we have been led there by the consumer. Um, you know, you asked me a question about, you know, what was the initial spark? What was the epiphany? For me, it was about a knowledge of business and something that could be done better and a story that could be told better to connect with, with consumers. I'm a storyteller and I'm a marketer at heart. And I want people to understand the truths about food industry and the, the tiny, tiny changes that they can make in their day-to-day -day diet to make overall huge improvements in consumption and planetary and personal health. So for us, it's taking a special uh, a speciality of, of the knowledge of food and sharing that, you know, frozen is the best way of, of eating seasonally, eating out of season so that things don't have to be shipped across the, the world in 
five days so that everyone can have a ripe cherry tomato that never came from anywhere close to their front doorstep. And our, our objective is to not only educate people about eating more vegetables, which is what our goal is, but also that it can be tasty without any, you know, unnatural ingredients. This is, you know, convenience and taste without overcomplicating things or without putting products and, and ingredients in there that are for elongation of life unnecessarily. You know, fr frozen is a natural preservation method, which means that everyone can eat healthy and sustainably at all times without hazarding a thought. You know, I have this, this, um, this, 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 this line that, that, that kind of rings very, very true for people quite often, which is you should be able to look at the front of the pack and understand and trust a brand that is doing the right thing without having to look at what's on, what's in it at the back. You know, we, we need to move to a situation where trusting a product because of the efforts of a brand, be they sustainable or educative or, um, you know, trying to disrupt a, a culture of consumption for, for better, you know, human health is, is, is there without having to look into, you know, what's the real motive here? You know, who, who owns this company and so on and so forth. So for us, we've always been, you know, a company who wanted to do good. Um, in addition to a company who wants to make profit, we have, you know, recently become a B Corp. Um, and to be honest, it was really just a, a registration of something that we were already doing. You know, we set out as a company and a group of, you know, 40 people now who feel that we have a privilege as a business who succeeded that we can't just sit on our hands and not do anything about the communication of, of, of better health. So B Corp was, a, a, I suppose, a, an illustration of how we could, you know, join the club of other people who are doing it. But we've all, always done better business in recycling our water waste, using our vegetable waste to create biogas to power the, the, the turbines that create the electricity for some of the plants that we run using regenerative agriculture and most importantly looking after the mental health of our people while we push them so hard to work so hard to, to do all of this that we're looking after them at the other side as well so they're just things that are part of the strong roots fabric and culture um but um uh, I think we're, you know, I was delighted to see on LinkedIn somewhere today that there's now 4,000 B Corp companies. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, it's still a tiny, tiny amount in comparison to to the amount of businesses in the world. So for our, for our listeners and viewers, Sam, can you walk them through what a B Corp, being a B Corp company really means? Because not most people understand. It. Yeah. B Corp is the easiest way to, to explain B Corp is, is the idea of a, of a triple bottom line. Okay. It's about uh, planet, people, and profit, and not just one of those things. So making sure that, um, you know, while, while you're doing business, you're doing good at the same time. There's, there's no reason that companies, especially food companies, could be in any way, um, you know, meaningfully doing harm to either society or planet or personal health. So B Corp company is, is it being a part of an organization that as a collective is trying to do better business by, by simply, you know, uh, uh, acknowledging that um, when we think about making profits, we have to think about the planet and we have to think about our people and the people in society at the same time. You know, you started your company in Dublin. You still have your headquarters there. You're in New Jersey right now. Explain a little bit about Dublin as a startup community. I know a lot about San Diego. I know a lot about Boston and the Cambridge area and uh, Silicon Alley in New York, Silicon Valley in California, Seattle in, in the Pacific Northwest. What's Dublin like? Is it a, a great area to start a startup like yours and, and create a whole you know, new industry? Absolutely. Dublin, Dublin is, Dublin's awesome. And um, not just because I lived and grew up there, but, um, you know, Dublin has become 
an incubator for some of the best and most innovative businesses in the world. I think, you know, um, there's a lot of food businesses uh, that have become famous on the island and off the island, but it's particularly known for um, for tech. Um, it's a really, really, uh, um, you know, driven tech hub. There's some great um, incubator programs. You know, one in particular is is called Dog Patch, which is which is run by various different organisations in collaboration with government and um, has has been hugely subscribed over the years. Um, uh, you know, web, things like Web Summit have been founded in Dublin, which is one of the central points for the the Silicon Valley community as a, as a as a central place of innovation. Um, in addition to the fact that there's some of the you know biggest food companies in the world that are based in and around uh, the island of Ireland, but the best thing about Dublin is that the camaraderie and people. You know, it's um, it's a place where um, people want good business to be done, um, but people love having fun at the same time, and that that is the the key mix of 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 things to understand when. When thinking about Dublin, and I'm hoping you'll experience that when you go there. I too. will. Oh, I'm so excited. Trust me. What? what where was the was the industry shocked because your your family brand is such a big name, and you're of course named after the namesake brand. Was it a little bit shocked? You could have taken the easy way in life, and nothing's easy. And I don't want to de degrade uh, generational family members that go into their family business. No such thing is easy. But you could have had a nice position that set for you with your name on the family brand and just stayed there and made a very great living, I'm sure, and done really good by selling delicious fruits and vegetables and produce throughout Ireland. But you took the different route. You took the road less traveled. You took, you, you, you found a new mountain to climb. Um, was the industry shocked? Was, was, was your local community and family and friends shocked? Or how, or or were you were you always the guy they would they knew would would was just going to go do something something different one day? No, I, I certainly wasn't naturally entrepreneurial. Um, I, I think um, I, I felt that I had a privilege through the education that I'd grown up in to go and do something more, and that there was this huge opportunity that you know I, I wanted to create a global brand, um, and therefore. A clean break and you know um, fresh, fresh runway was 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 the way to do that. Uh, yeah, of course, family shocked. Uh, you know, customers and industry shocked for sure for a very very short time, but then you know as soon as we launched, I think the pieces kind of got together for everybody, and it it's a it's a very small community both in food and in Ireland, uh, food globally, Ireland locally. So I think, um, you know, I'm still doing what I did for, for 10 years through the family business, just in a, in a different way. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's about, uh, for, for me, I think um, it is about using, using the knowledge that you've got to the best advantage. Um, because uh, so many people don't get the opportunity to do it. How many, how, how many countries do you sell in now, Sam? I'm sure I'll get this wrong because it's 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 getting bigger by the day. But I think we're available in in about fifteen uh, countries today. Um, Ireland, the UK, and the USA being our our home markets uh, where we've set up shop and 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 um, have local operations. But we also sell in 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 far places like um, Iceland. Uh, we sell in uh, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Singapore. Most recently. Um, in uh, Belgium and the Netherlands, and soon to be um, Australia and Canada. So the footprint is growing by the day, and um, yeah, it's great to see. You know, we're realizing our dream, which is awesome. But Sam, you're a young, young man, and you've already accomplished a lot. Give me your vision for the next five years. Where do you want to take strong roots, and where can it go? We, we set up to create a global brand, and that's what we're doing, um, but we're far from being there yet. So, you know, when I think about how we can tell the story about sustainability and plant-based consumption and making it easier to access foods 
that are both affordable and tasty at the same time. You know, our goal over the next kind of three to five years is to make our products available for about 10% of the global population. So we want to exist in territories and have enough distribution to be able to achieve to achieve that. I mean, ultimately, we believe that, you know, we're the bird's eye or, you know, McCain's of, of the next generation. Those foods were our foods. Those foods were our parents' foods. And um, what we're trying to do at Strong Roots you know, in a, in a sustainable growth pattern is to be able to build a brand that people trust without the, you know, um, uh, w- without the, the palaver or, or, or showmanship and something that's really uh, embedded in something real. So um, that's the goal. So we've got a, we've got a, a steep mountain to continue to climb, but um the, the team are up for it, so Damn. I'm, I'm very confident. I have no doubt that when I have you back on this show, you're going to be reaching, you're going to be up that mountain and, and, and getting closer to the top because that's how so. Great, that's how so. Yeah. Oh, and you have a great brand. I'm so excited about it because we've moved away just from plant-based burgers, which, of course, like I said, I love, but I have a one-year-old granddaughter, my first granddaughter, grandchild. And getting her on your spinach bites and cauliflower bites and, and, and sweet potato fries, she'll love that stuff. Never even know what the other stuff existed out in this world. And what, once she's on your stuff as a young kid, that will set patterns of good eating, set her up for a life of success of good eating habits. And that's why I'm so excited to have you on today and to share your journey, to share your story. It's so important for people to try your brand. You don't have to be 100% vegetarian. You don't have to be 100% vegan, but you got to try Strong Roots. All their great products are so delicious and they're also good for you. They're good for the environment. They're good for the community you live in. Sam Dennigan, you're always welcome back on this show. Thank you for the great food that you make at Strong Roots. For our listeners, go to www.strongroots.com to find Sam and his colleagues. You're always welcome back on the Impact Show. You make the world a better place. Thank you for being what you are and making such a great brand, a food brand for all of us to enjoy. John, thanks for having me. This has been awesome. An absolute pleasure to meet you. This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by Engage. Engage is a digital booking platform revolutionizing the talent booking industry. With thousands of athletes, celebrities, entrepreneurs, and business leaders, Engage is the go-to spot for booking talent, for speeches, custom experiences, live streams, and much more. For more information on Engage or to book talent today, visit letsengage.com.